Um, this is good. I wish we could do this with our presidential candidates. <laughs> so let me make a short introduction, Terry. Especially one of them. <laughs> so it is my, my greatest honor and pleasure to welcome to our online seminar, uh, Terry Rockefeller from uh, University of Washington, Seattle. So Terry Rockefeller is a giant. Yeah. He, he was so important and he, is, hey, true. he was in the past for our community. So he did all a lot of, of nice things, yeah, starting with his nice book on commercial analysis. Then he wrote us another book, many books, but another relevant one, the Roger Wetz on non-smooth analysis. And so there's so, so many important notions. Yeah. We are, and, and all his research impacted yeah, our community. I mean, it, it was, it was so ama amazing, it's so amazing. So it's, it's uh, the, the giant of, of our community. So thank you, Terry, for accepting our invitation. So we are looking forward to your talk. So it's six o'clock in the morning in, in Seattle. Thank you again for, for agreeing to give this talk. So the stage is yours. Okay, that's such a pleasure. And I wanna thank you, Radu, and the others involved with this uh, organization to make this possible. This is really such a huge service to our community. It's, it's just wonderful at a time when otherwise uh, we are, are, are missing opportunities to share ideas. And of course, sharing ideas is something I've it's been so important to me for so many years. And uh, um, as I suppose it's unusual for me at my age, I'll be uh, uh, 86 uh, in a few months. Uh, to be sharing ideas, but I'm so excited. The COVID situation in some ways has liberated me to catch up on my research and writing, and uh, I'm going to be talking about some of that. But but it, uh, it relates to the things I've been passionate about for so many years, trying to find the, the, the real ideas behind certain theoretical features that are broad and, and uh, what to say about them. So, so uh, that's what this talk is about. And the, the key idea is that, uh, there is something about sufficient conditions that is deeply involved in convexity and duality, subjects, of course, which I really yeah. love. But, but it, it relates to the things I've been passionate about for so many years, trying to find the, the, the real ideas behind certain... What's happening? I'm getting some echo. Sorry for that. There was a, a yeah, a microphone. It was it switch like on. a delayed, uh, okay. Yeah, All right, right. Well, let me just proceed with the talk then. So um, let's start with by just considering uh, what, what to think about sufficient conditions. Optimization. So the classical view of this is uh, roughly that you, uh, you, you are presented with some candidates for optimality and you want to sort them out and eliminate ones which are false. And uh, they, you want to have necessary and sufficient conditions as close as possible. But that's not really what we use sufficient conditions for in modern optimization, because we don't have candidates. All we do is compute them and they're never exact. There's always some little error in them. So what we use sufficient conditions for is to design and justify methodologies for, for, for numerical uh, uh, algorithms. And uh, you, you, the conditions should be, they shouldn't be weird or too special, then they wouldn't be useful. So they have to be conditions that uh, describe typical kinds of circumstances that you might readily expect, although there could be exceptions. And, uh, and yet, even when you go back to the very basics of this, you see there's a connection with uh, convexity, which people haven't thought very much about for good reason. So the most elementary example is you just consider minimizing a smooth function on Rn. Everything in this talk will be finite dimensional, by the way, for simplicity at least. And, you, and the question is, uh, what, do, what do you have for a sufficient condition for local optimality? Well, as we all know, the first order condition is that the gradient should be zero. And the second order one is that the, the uh, Hessian matrix at the point in question should be positive definite. Now we all know that this positive definiteness, in fact, makes the, the function be strongly convex in a neighborhood of this point. So in a sense, uh, this condition says that if you are doing a, a numerical method uh, locally around this point X bar, you are essentially in a framework of convex optimization. And then the question is, is this a phenomenon that is more general? And I'm going to try to convince you that there's, it's actually far more general than you could possibly imagine. 
So uh, let's look at the situation in another fairly elementary case. Uh, classical nonlinear programming just with equality constraints and smooth functions. So I just want to minimize a function subject to some equations. And, and I notice the misnotation in red uh, for, let me see, I can play around with this. I guess I can use this thing to point, but I don't really need to. Um, I'm going to use this notation capital L. I'll have a little L later. Capital L is the classical Lagrangian that we all know and love for a long time. And uh, the, the way you can write the first order conditions for this, this classical problem is that both the gradient in X and the gradient in Y, I like this duality between X and Y, so my multipliers are always Y when the primal vectors are X. So the first order condition can be written in this gradient fashion with Lagrangian. And then the second order condition, which we know, is that the Hessian should be positive definite relative to the, the vectors that are orthogonal to the constraint gradients. Now, this, this, is, this doesn't look like it could have any connection with convex optimization. Yes, you're, you're looking at a subgradient and all that, but the, but the, but the problem itself is hardly uh, convex, since you could have nonlinear constraints here. But the augmented Lagrangian goes a long way to bringing something out. So in, in this setting, the augmented Lagrangian is just uh, obtained by adding some multiple of the squares of the constraint gradients. And, and then you can see, this is a classical little kind of a lemma result, that uh, if, if the augmentation parameter R is high enough, uh, well, uh, th th this classical condition corresponds to the existence of R high enough so that you have at this pair X bar Y bar, a saddle point locally, but it's a saddle point of convex concave type. So there's a product of convex sets, uh, a neighborhood of this pair, on which this augmented Lagrangian is convex concave. So that means that locally you have the, all the duality that comes with a convex concave problem with a primal and a dual, a local primal and a local dual. And this is actually the secret behind, uh, the unrealized secret behind classical augmented Lagrangian methods like the Hessian's power method of multipliers and so forth that actually is, is generated with how people fully understanding it by the fact that you have a reduction to convex optimization. So if you had this kind of saddle point situation, then as long as you are using a method that only involves local points near your X bar, Y bar, and local values and subgradients of the augmented Lagrangian, then it's indistinguishable from convex optimization. Oh, of course, there's an issue that you don't know in advance what neighborhood this should be. That's a separate matter. All right, now, now to get this much farther, I'm going to adopt a framework of what might be called generalized nonlinear programming. This is the kind of model I've used in a lot of ways. And a lot of what I could say could be more general, less general, but I, but I like usually to pick a vehicle that has a lot of new things, but on the other hand, isn't too broad to be start to be confusing and raise questions. So in this kind of model, I want to minimize, I still have my functions F0, F1, up to Fm, and, uh, but I'm going to introduce what I call a modeling function, G, and I apply G to this vector of, it's not exactly constraint functions because, anyway, I have a vector of functions, of capital F now, and I apply this G to it. And this is what I want to minimize. So uh, obviously this, uh, this relates to things we all know a lot about. But if you took this G to be the indicator of a closed convex cone, then, then the, the G term, the modeling term would just be this constraint. Oh, that, there's a mistake there. It should be capital, a, capital F of X. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Capital F of X should be in K. So it's the usual cone, cone model. Capital F of X should be in the cone K. But there are many other possibilities. For example, you could take G to be a norm. And, and then this could be uh, some kind of regularization. Or you could be doing least squares for that matter. <clears throat> and then, but here's still another thing which shows that the potential for non-smoothness. You could take G to be what I call the VEC max function, where you take the max, you have a, apply it to a vector U, you take the maximum of the components of U. So in this case, what you'd be minimizing in this 
problem would be uh, f of x plus the max of finitely many smooth, let's say, functions. So this is a non-smooth problem. But, but these are just like the seeds of what you could do because there could be mixtures. Your, your, your uh, capital F could be divided up into different vector components and you could apply a different modeling function to each component. One could be like some cone constraints or some non-cone constraints uh, or there's some regularization term or some max term. So all of this could be put together. So this is actually quite a broad model. And uh, but one thing that's missing that I would usually put in it is I would put in the indicator for some set capital X. Uh, the vector X should be along to capital X. And you could do that, but it uh, technically it causes a lot of uh, nuisance and complications in what I want to say. So I'd rather, I prefer here to simply say that I could constrain, I could do that through this mixture aspect. It would be slightly different, but it, you know, it would be good enough. All right, now what about like Lagrangians? Uh, Lagrangians arise because you introduce perturbations uh, that generate dual variables. So the way I, I can think about it in this simple situation is I, I perturb in here, I, I add this canonical perturbation to this vector and inside the modeling function. So that way I get a function phi of these two variables, but I really want the u to be zero. That's my real problem. So I think of it as minimizing this subject to u equals zero. Oops. Uh, now that there's, of course, uh, there are two ways to look at it. Uh, you could also say uh, uh, that the u represents a perturbation. And for each different u, I have a different problem in x. I like that point of view. But, but writing it this way, you can see, if I write it with a constraint u equals zero, I can imagine there's a Lagrange multiplier for that constraint. Either way, then in this setting, you, you get the Lagrangian, which uh, has a general formula here, and uh, in terms of the function phi, and this comes out in my model to be, oops, my computer is terribly sensitive. It keeps anticipating something that I didn't actually want it to anticipate that I wanted to do. So, all right, so <laughs> better be careful about pu pushing this around. But so the, the Lagrangian would be the classical Lagrangian minus the, the conjugate of the model modeling function, which is just those proper convex function. And uh, then uh, in, in the case, for example, that you had uh, the, the constraint cone K, this would be the indicator of the dual cone multiplier space. But then what about the augmented Lagrangian? It works in this very general setting. This is also in the variational analysis book. So the difference there is when you take this minimum, you include this quadratic term, and then you can get the augmented Lagrangian to come out, depending on whether you want to use a primal or a dual formulation, you can calculate it in two ways. So you see two different expressions, and they involve functions that are, that are generated from the modeling function R uh, in terms of uh, what you see just below, which involves some kind of infimal convolution or regularization of the function in question. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, and they have, uh, have nice properties that will be useful. And one aspect of it to point out is that if, if the functions fi, starting with f0, if they are just c1 functions, then the augmented Lagrangian will be a c1 function. This, by the way, would not happen if I had the indicator of a set x, which is would just be one reason for it to be inconvenient at this stage of modeling. But what if the functions are c2? You don't get a c2 Lagrangian. You get one which is what I call C1 plus, which is that it's, um, it's, it's C1 and the gradient mapping is lip, locally Lipschitz continuous. That comes out of the convex analysis of these functions GR. And the cone case, the most familiar one, is where G and its conjugate are the indicators of polar cones. And in that case, these functions that enter the augmented Lagrangians are squared distance functions to these cones. So this is a very uh, familiar kind of an object. Let's now go through, pay attention to the time here, so I don't have a clock easily. Okay. <clears throat> All right, now let's, let's have to, of course, before we get into second order types of optimality, we have to look at first order optimality. So I uh, remind you of the objective here in red, this phi, and it's just, in, in general, a lower semi-continuous 
proper function. It's not convex, but it has properties that are called subdifferential continuity and regularity. Subdifferential regularity has to do with how you can write the subgradients in an easy way. And that's shown here in the brown inequality. So subgradients, when you have something that's subdifferentially regular, they have a, a, an inequality just like in convex analysis, except you have at the end this, this little O term. And subdifferential continuity means that the, the value of the function varies continuously with the subgradients. Anyway, we are in a situation, because of my underlying assumptions, where I can just limit to this and I don't have to get into the complications of limiting subgradients. That, that simplifies matters. So the first quarter condition comes out as simply that there is a multiplier vector y bar uh, satisfying the subdifferential inequality in terms of this function phi. And I'm interested in sufficiency, but we, we know that under some typical uh, constraint qualification, a mild constraint qualification and variational analysis, this will be a, uh, a necessary condition. But I'm more interested in the fact that the same condition can be expressed in the, with the augmented Lagrangian for any, any positive value of the augmenting parameter in terms of the first order condition, the gradient in X should vanish and the gradient in Y should vanish. Now, uh, the, now the, this augmented Lagrangian is always concave in Y. So for the gradient in Y to vanish, that's the same as saying that, uh, it, that Y bar is the, the global maximum in, in the dual argument. But what I want to point out is that this is, you remember we, we looked at a saddle point in the in classical nonlinear programming with uh, equality constraints. And this is the first order condition for a saddle point. <clears throat> and even more than that, because you actually do have maximization in a dual argument, but you don't necessarily have convexity. So you don't have minimization necessarily in the first or in the primal argument. Another interpretation of the second of the condition of second order uh, thing is that that gradient in y equaling zero, that's the same as the, as the underlying multiplier condition, which is that y bar should be a subgradient of g <coughs> at the vector f of x bar. If g is the classical constraint cone in nonlinear programming, for example, that simply refers to the complementary slackness conditions in the, uh, the KKT conditions. So this is a generalization of the KKTP conditions to that this model of um, generalized nonlinear programming. Now, what would be the convex case? What would be generalized convex programming? That is the case where the uh, the uh, Lagrangian is convex, <clears throat> or you could say, or it also corresponds then to where the augmented Lagrangian is convex in X. So then I would have a global convex concave function and I would have a global saddle point. And then I would have all that duality, all that carries through with, uh, with this model, just as it would in convex programming, all the duality theory. But we can ask the question, what about, what would it mean? We could have a local saddle point. In addition to the concavity we already have in Y, we could have local convexity in X around this X bar. Then we would have a situation of somehow reducing the problem to convex programming locally. And now, what is it that would give us this? That's my fundamental question. Just what in our optimality conditions corresponds to that? When do we have it and when we don't? Because it seems to be really fundamental. When do we have it? Now I have to get into a, a more esoteric issue, which will probably um, cause you some perplexity to start with because it's a bit unfamiliar. <clears throat> so I want to talk about a kind of hidden convexity, which will play a big role here. So I just want to look now at a function on Rn, which has seems to have nothing to do with convexity. It's uh, lower semi-continuous proper, and it has subdifferential continuity and regularity. This is helps me avoid uh, technicalities, and it's all that I need here now. Which means of here that the subgradients, as you see in the second line, the subgradients of this function are given by an inequality, just like in convex analysis. Uh, but it's it, it's missing something. Sorry, typos should have f of x here. 
should be f of x here, sorry. Uh, and a plus, plus the error term, little o term. All you need to, to get beyond convex analysis is to put this little, little error term in here. All right, now here's the thing that you have to get your mind around. The question of when this is function is variationally convex at the point x bar for the particular subgradient um, v bar. And it means something local, local, and this is a key now, this convex neighborhood, not only of x, of x bar, but also of the subgradient v bar. Uh, so I have a product of convex sets, a neighborhood of x bar v bar such that, now here's the key idea in red, which simply says that I cannot distinguish in this neighborhood, I cannot distinguish the function f in terms of its values and subgradients from those of a lower semi-continuous proper convex function. I can't tell the difference if I can only have that information about f. <clears throat> so a technical way of, of saying it is that there's a function h less than or equal f, such that in this neighborhood, the graph of the subgradients of h agrees with the graph of the subgradients of f, but also for, for these points, the function values agree. And there's a strong version of this in which the function h is strongly convex. Now for most people I find when I try to explain this, they, they find it hard to get imagine what this could be if it isn't local convexity. And I'll get to that in a moment, but <clears throat> here, here was how I got into this and why I arrived at this. And I actually worked at this some years earlier, but, but uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, uh, because of something else I was doing, this came up again and I, I got it more generally. So I got this theorem, which shows that this is a, a, a very basic property in the following sense. This property holds for this pair, this pair in the graph of the subgradient mapping, if and only if the subgradient mapping is maximal monotone locally there. So it would mean in this case that in this neighborhood, it satisfies monotonicity and it's maximal with respect to that neighborhood. You can't add anything within that neighborhood. And so, so this is, so, okay, now we're getting to something too, because maximal monotonicity is important for a lot of computational methods. And maybe you can do it locally. A lot of the theory of maximal monotonicity is, is uh, propagated in some global manner. And of course that's great, but you can also do it locally, locally. And that way you're able to do non-convex things as we'll see. Now I want you to notice that if I, if I look at this condition of variational convexity with the subgradient being zero, V bar equals zero, then, then that implies that F has a local minimum at X bar. Why exactly? Well, because you can't distinguish F from, an, from a convex function H, and according to that stuff in red, it would mean that H has a, a, a minimum at X bar, uh, but then F has to do too because of what's in red. And, and, if, and this, the version of this with strong uh, convexity, variational strong convexity, where that function H is strongly convex, that would mean that this, that's equivalent to this local minimum being uh, tilt stable, which is that if you add tiny uh, linear terms to it, you only perturb it in a Lipschitz continuous manner, single valued Lipschitz continuous manner. So you can see this, this concept, obscure as it may be at first, is, is something really very basic to maximum monotonicity and tilt stability. All right now here, let's try to, get, try to explain again. So I wrote in red again at the top, this, this thing about what the, what the property is, but how is it related to local convexity? <clears throat> well, in, in this property, I have a neighborhood of the point X bar, but also a neighborhood of V bar. If, v, if this neighborhood of V bar is just the whole space, then I get local convexity. It is to say that the function F is convex on a neighborhood of X bar. So what's really different here, and this is just, is just the most basic, but most special important thing about it. So you have to realize that you can, uh, um, you can localize convexity both in primal and dual arguments. The V localizes in a dual argument. That makes it really different. That's what causes all the difference. 
<clears throat> All right, now here are two simple examples, which I hope we can uh, will help you understand uh, the difference. So let's look at a function here, f of x on, on r, a one-dimensional thing, which is absolute value function minus the square function. And you can understand uh, uh, easily, you can easily get a mental picture of this. This is like a thing with two wings, symmetric around the origin, and has kind of a, right at the origin, it looks very much like the value function, but then it swings around on both sides in a concave fashion. So this is a join of two concave functions. There's nothing convex at all about this function if you're looking at it just in the primal argument. But now, now we're focusing on the origin. I'm, I'm looking, it does have uh, zero as a subgrading at zero. It has a local minimum, obviously, at the origin. And uh, it's a, a strong local minimum and so forth. So I'm looking at the subgradient zero and the X bar is, the, is zero. And, and, and uh, I claim that this is um, an example of strong variational convexity, but how, how do I know that? I could compute it maybe in some way. I could give an example of the function h that fits the definition, but I can use this other equivalence. If you look at the subgradient mapping for this function, what would that look like? Well, this little function f, it's, it's, uh, it's smooth on both sides of the origin, and you get <clears throat> actually some kind of linear pieces for the subgradient. The graph of the subgradient would have linear pieces to the right and left of the origin. But at the origin, it has a vertical segment a vertical segment between minus one and plus one. So in other words, then, if you look at this graph of the subgradient mapping around the origin, you take a neighborhood, all you would see is a vertical segment. That's an example of a local maximal monotonicity, actually strong maximal monotonicity. So this is strongly variational and convex. Now here's another exa re revealing example from a different direction, an example in two dimensions. So now I have x1 and x2 and r2, R and I have a function which is a, a concave quadratic function just of x2, x2 minus x2 squared. It's concave, strongly concave. And But the domain is just the parabola, x2 equals x1 squared. Everywhere else it's in infinity. Now, so look, the, the domain of this function isn't convex. And, and the, the objective part aside from this is this concave function of x2. How can this be strongly variationally convex? Well, it is because you can easily find that this is tilt stable. If I, it has a local minimum at the origin, and as I add small linear functions to that and move them around, the, 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 the minimum behaves in a, Lipsch, a single value Lipschitz continuous manner. So I know through the theorems that this is equivalent to a strong variational inequality, but there's another way to look at it too. You could look at this example as I, I have an equation constraint and I have a C2 function. I'm minimizing a C2 function subject to a C2 e equality constraint. And I could look at the second order sufficient condition, classical second order sufficient condition the one that I showed for such a nonlinear programming with equality constraints. And this is an example of X bar being a solution that satisfies the strong second order sufficient conditions. So this is the kind of connection I'm, I'm aiming at. This strong variational con, uh, uh, convexity uh, uh, is, is somehow gonna be related to strong, some generalization of strong second order sufficiency. So here, here's the condition then that I'm going to, to give. So now here we have our, our problem again. I'm in my, I have this problem I'm minimizing in phi subject to u equals zero. And I want you to observe that <coughs> I could add, I could harmlessly add to this objective something about the square of the perturbation variable. Since I'm minimizing subject to u two, the values of u other than zero don't affect the underlying problem that I'm dealing with. The solutions, everything about the underlying problem would be the same, but of course the perturbations are, but the perturbations are only affected by a vertical motion, let's say, but it has a profound effect on the augmented Lagrangian. Anyway, <coughs> uh, 
on the Lagrangian, you get the augmented Lagrangian. So, so here's what I propose as a new sufficient condition, a variationally sufficient condition for local optimality. Actually, I propose this already in a paper that's been published in uh, that I, in which I worked on some methods of decomposition, uh, very far ranging methods of decomposition for variational inequalities, but also optimality. And in there, I needed to understand uh, uh, something about local maximum monotonicity. And anyway, I arrived at this in, in that paper already. So it's already published, but now I'm exploring it more. All right, now, so what I wanna do is combine the first order optimality condition, which we already had, and then that's unchanged. That also is unchanged by adding this, by passing to this function phi r with a square term in it. So the condition is that for this augmenting parameter r high enough, this augmented objective should be variationally convex for the elements in question. And then there would be the strong version, which is variational strong convexity. All right, now, now, there's, now we, we could start to talk about how then some tilt stability would come into this, but there's another way of looking at this tilt stability, which is that, this, because a lot of people understand that many things in numerical optimization and sufficient conditions are connected with quadratic growth conditions of the objective around the optimal point. So let's make that connection. And, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on the strong version of this sufficient condition. So uh, it, 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 it can be shown that this, this condition is equivalent to a kind of a, a, a more robust quadratic growth condition, which is not just at the point, but is somehow lo locally around the point. So there should exist neighborhoods such that <coughs> um, Actually, I think I don't need the little O term there. The O term should O term shouldn't be there. So this, no, okay, I see, I see. No, this is a mistake. What I should have had instead of the little O term down here, what I should have had instead of little O term here is a quadratic term. Oops, a quadratic a quadratic term. That's exactly what I should have. So yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. You understand that? So what this this line in blue should be here? I have to be so careful. This touchpad is so touchy, it keeps thinking I want to tap something. And even though I have tap turned down to the very minimum possible. All right, so it should say that this is this blue thing, right? Oh, damn it. Right. So this should be, uh, this line should be a quadratic growth condition. All right. Now, uh, another thing I want to say about this variational sufficient condition for local optimality in the strong form is that if the function phi happens to be a C2 function, which is possible, at least it's going to be C2 around the point in question, then, then this corresponds to something we would already know. What would be the strong variational, what strong condition for minimization of this function? It would say that the gradient, the sh that we look at the space, the x2, the pairs x, what well, u, where u equals zero, that's a certain subspace s. The gradient of phi should be perpendicular to this, and then the Hessian should be positive definite relative to that subspace. That's what this would exactly come down to if the function isn't C2, right? All right, now, let's see, we're going on time here, is that I guess. Uh, <clears throat> all right, now we come to the mean theorems. Here are the mean theorems. And uh, here's something that, may surprise you at first. So I'm only going to assume for this that my functions are C1 functions. Usually everything about second order optimality, people assume that this underlying data there would be C2 functions, but this, these results don't need that. C2 can come in later for some other purpose, but I don't need it here. <clears throat> so the functions are just C1. And then I worked so hard on this to get it to be if and only if, but it's true. So this, the variational, this is just, this is not the strong condition, this is just a general. Variational, su variationally sufficient condition for local optimality for an X bar and a multiplier vector and a parameter vector R holds, if and only if the following holds, which I've been aiming at all this time, 
There's a convex neighborhood of this primal dual pair such that you not only have concavity in the, in the y vector, but you have convexity in the, in the x vector. And you have at this point a saddle point of the augmented Lagrangian for this augmenting value r. So you have a convex concave problem. So, so your problem is reduced locally in primal dual terms to convex optimization. If you have an algorithmic procedure that operates without knowing anything more than, than this, what you need to get out of this augmented Lagrangian around this point, it would operate exactly as if you're in convex optimization. This is something that doesn't seem to have been realized that there is such a, well, we'll have to come into how this related to other optimality conditions that are much more familiar to people, but, but Anyway, that, that this is this is something uh, pretty deep that would relate. Anyway, this is, okay. So this theorem says that this condition that may seem peculiar or obscure is exactly equivalent, exactly equivalent to this saddle point reduction of your problem to convexity, and then you can pursue this further because when you have uh, uh, the saddle point condition, you have associated with it primal and dual problem. So I try to write this out here, a primal problem P, a dual problem D, where you minimize a certain, in the primal problem, you minimize a certain convex function that's coming from the augmented Lagrangian, and in the dual, you maximize a certain concave function coming from the dual. This is all standard convex analysis, and uh, it's elementary that the saddle point condition in this situation <clears throat> is equivalent to your X bar solving the primal problem, the Y bar solves the dual problem, and the minimum in the primal equals the maximum in the dual. This is a standard stuff, but this is now in, in this augmented, uh, uh, I mean, this, this uh, generalized nonlinear programming thing. But this idea goes beyond that. I, I think this goes much, much farther. And, and, uh, and I know it goes farther in a lot of other cases. And, and this is simply the presentation I'm giving here now in terms of augmented, uh, of this generalized nonlinear programming because it's uh, easier to get your, your mind around it. Now here's the second theorem. So as I say, I'm interested in the strong variational sufficiency. What extra? you need. So what we have already was the saddle point. What extra thing about this convex concave saddle point corresponds to the strong version? Well, one thing you can conjecture turns out to be true. It's equivalent to the additional factor fact that the augmented Grangian should be strongly convex in the X. Then there's another way, another thing is actually is equivalent to something that seems even stronger than that, which is a property I call augmented tilt stability. And here's the definition of it. <clears throat> so in this definition, I'm looking at, uh, over here, I'm looking at what happens if, if you fix a multiplier vector and you minimize <clears throat> the augmented Lagrangian in X, now, many of you may recognize that this is the, just the kind of thing that comes up in methods of multipliers. You're going to minimize an augmented Lagrangian in X for a particular multiplier vector. And what it says is this type of problem is tilt stable. But not just tilt stable, the solution, the local solution to this kind of thing is, is uh, single valued and Lipschitz continuous as a function of the pair V, Y near zero y bar. And by the way, the modulus of Lipschitz continuity in this situation is the modulus of strong convexity, which we have up here in the theorem, this local strong, this convexity on, up oh, here's another mistake. This, this should be a script X, not a capital X. Script X, the neighborhood script X, right? And, uh, and so this, this uh, suggests something which is true that about numerical optimization, that if you want to do methods of multipliers in augmented 
in this generalized nonlinear programming, and that includes a lot. It's a lot of non-smooth stuff, regularization terms, a lot of things people don't even imagine you could apply uh, methods of multipliers. You could do all of that. I'll, I'll get back to this. And, and, and strong variational sufficiency will be the key to making that work because you need this sort of augmented tilt stability in the analysis of those methods. So again, this strong variational sufficiency is is, is a basic to this area for, for another reason. All right, now let's, let's uh, try to get on with the issue of how, how to connect this up with what we, other we because we already have uh, some knowledge of second order conditions, sufficiency conditions. And uh, most of it is in special cases. But let's uh, uh, look at this example. <laughs> Now, for this purpose, I am going to let the functions be C2 because all the other conditions have C2 functions and that's all will make the relationship. So, so uh, I want to understand how strong variational sufficiency uh, goes there. And, and let's look at classical nonlinear programming. So classical nonlinear programming now, we have inequality as well as equality constraints. And these are C2 functions. And I have the, this is a, the constraints are given by a classical constraint cone K and the polar cone, which I call Y, because my multipliers are Y, <coughs> is this product of a, of a partial non-linear non orthogonal. But anyway, we understand all that. This cones for the multipliers. And you recall my notation, I'm using capital L just for the classical Lagrangian function. And then what, is, what does the strong sufficiency condition in this case mean? It's actually equivalent to the strong second order sufficient condition, extremely familiar in numerical uh, optimization, even though we don't always have it, obviously. <clears throat> but but some, there are different versions of strong, what people call strong second order sufficient condition. So let's be clear which one I mean. <clears throat> this is the one in which I take the subspace, capital S, depends on both this X bar and the Y bar, to be the subspace consisting of the vectors that are orthogonal to all the active constraint vectors, by which I mean the equation vectors, and well, not just that, the act, the all the ones with, with uh, no, no, sorry, no, it's more subtle, the, the inequality constraints with positive multipliers; those are in particular active. <coughs> I don't include the ones which have zero multipliers, but uh, inequalities that are active. So, in, so this is a bigger subspace. And uh, so the positive definiteness relative to the subspace. Some people, by the strong second order sufficient condition, also in, include uh, things about the active constraints. Or and, and you notice, though, that this does not cover, I'm not asking for any linear independence of constraint gradients. That's not involved. That's one of the virtues of this. No, I don't need this linear independence. So the, the, here's one of the main points I want to make in this whole talk that's it's suggested by this. This condition of strong variational sufficiency is equivalent to this very important famous condition in classical nonlinear programming. And therefore, we can view it perhaps as the natural extension of the strong second order sufficient condition to all of generalized nonlinear programming. Now, well, we can do that because we can do that. But let's see if I can support that with some more evidence. <clears throat> so I would just like to, to know this is getting a little more technical. I'm getting not too far from the end. And at the end, I'll have some wind up with some more philosophy in it. I have two slides now that are demonstrating some new techniques which have not before been used exactly in second order optimality conditions, but they, are, they, are, they, they serve extremely well for this purpose. So, so to, to see what I wanna do here, you remember I have this augmented Lagrangian and I, I'm, and I have a pair X bar, Y bar, where uh, it satisfies the first order condition and uh, and which is close to being a saddle point, but what I'm lacking is the convexity, strong convexity in the X variable at X bar. 
Well, suppose that augmented Lagrangian happens to be C2 around this point. That's true under some strong classical conditions. Then the strong variational sufficiency would equi be equivalent to the Hessian of the Lagrangian being positive definite at this point. That's, that's obvious enough. <clears throat> it actually goes back to my very first slide, my first slide about the uh, cl classical uh, minimizing an unsmooth function. But the problem is, of course, even if my functions in the problem, the Fi functions are C2 functions, the augmented Lagrangian is only C1 plus. It's not C2, but it, but it does have a gradient mapping, which is uh, uh, d differentiable almost everywhere. Well, it's, it's Lipschitz continuous. And so for the, the gradient mapping has, is differentiable almost everywhere. And now, and, and variational analysis is all very well understood and essentially means that the, you have a Hessian that exists all, for almost every pair x, y. Almost everywhere the Hessian exists. And what does that mean? There are various interpretations which can all be shown to coincide. There's a, so the, as I say, it can be the first, first uh, derivative of the gradient mapping. It can be a, uh, a quadratic expansion. It can be, um, and so forth. So anyway, this is well understood. The Hessian exists almost everywhere in an, an appealing sense. And then what I can do, because of this almost everywhereness, and by the way, those are all bounded by the Lipschitz, local Lipschitz constant, locally bounded. <clears throat> so I can take limits. So I can look at all the matrices H, Hessian type matrices of a sort, which I can get as limits of Hessians at nearby points as those points approach my pair x bar y bar. And this is then a compact set of matrices. And this I'm calling the Hessian bundle. And, and as you can see my notation here, I'm denoting it with this bar. I have a bar over the nabla, bar nabla, the Hessian bundle. So it's a compact set of matrices. You can show they're symmetric and so forth. Compact so symmetric matrices. <clears throat> and uh, and but but now I'm interested in the, the next part of it. So this is there's an x y argument. So I could take this x this h and I could partition it into four sub matrices: the x x, the x y, y x, and y y matrices. Obviously. So here's the theorem. Then the strong variational sufficiency condition holds if and only if at x bar all the Hessians in this Hessian bundle have the xx part positive definite. Now there's some interesting things in this from the variational uh, analysis point of view because <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of what I'm not showing here is there's a lot of things like epiconvergence and graphical convergence behind this to make use of the of, this is of some compactness and epitopology and so forth. So this is really it involves things which at least to me are very interesting from a from a point of view of use, utilizing variational analysis. All right, so that's relatively understandable here because it shows that this trend, this is a way of coping with the fact that you don't have C2, but you have C1 plus and you have positive uh, definiteness carried out into this way. Um, uh, but still, okay, how would you verify this? How would we understand better when this might be true? We somehow have to, to make another step of getting this back through the modeling functions G that are underlying this, uh, this uh, augmented Lagrangian. Because you see here at the bo bottom here, the augmented Lagrangian is produced by this function GR. And what was GR? GR was the infimal convolution between the G and um, the square of the norm. This is a, a nice kind of function. We have tools in, in convex analysis actually to understand the gradients, the gradient mapping of this. We can try to see what to do with the gradient mapping, how to relate the gradient mapping of this to G and so forth. So there's, we have a lot of tools available to make this kind con, uh, connection so that we could try to see in terms of our model, our model depends on the choice of the function G. We could try to see how, what it means back there. Okay, so this is my last technical slide, really technical slide. Uh, and this is this goes again a little uh, off into a bit of outer space because it has some ideas that, that are new. So I want to think of special quadratic functions, which I'll call quadratic forms. Uh, these, these are the quadratic functions 
I mean, all of this is convex right now. These are convex functions. These are quadratic forms that vanish at the origin and, are, and have minimum at the origin. So they are just purely things, but I need the half, the one half in here to make it, make things come out simply. So it should be something that you could write in this fashion. And, and here in this, I have an auxiliary vector. This is a vector in R m uh, omega. Um, omega q omega with q positive semi-definite. Okay, so that's, okay, but here's what's new. I wanna talk about a generalized quadratic form. And that's a quadratic form which has infinity. And the way you can think about it is it's a, it's the sum of this other kind of ordinary quadratic form with the indicator of a subspace. Now there's more to this than might meet the eye. You know, for example, now, now you could you can actually um, put in a condition that makes the Q be unique. To get the Q to be unique, uh, you have to say that it's, it's, there's a way of writing it so it only depends on the projections onto the space S. So you can actually associate a unique action. But what is this? These, these are the functions such that the subgradient mapping is a generalized linear mapping. Well, 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 what's a generalized linear mapping? A generalized linear mapping is a mapping whose graph is a subspace. Huh? It's a mapping whose graph is a subspace. That means its domain is a subspace and it's like a linear map. Well, I won't go into it. Anyway, so you could look at what, are, and this is, so this is something, a very basic class of objects, the generalized quadratic forms, and then associated with them, their, their subgradient mappings. All right, so what is generalized life differentiability? We, we know a lot in variational analysis of how to approach twice differentiability. You set up a second order difference quotient function, what I have here in blue. And this involves not, yeah, it involves a particular, it's at a point u, but it depends on a particular subgradient because this may not be a differentiable function, have more than one subgradient. So what you do, instead of putting in here the, the first derivative over the gradient, you put in this particular subgradient. And then again, for technical reason, we need to have a stick a half in here, make it come out to coincide with classical objects. Anyway, this function, as a function of omega, it's convex function of omega. So I'm looking at a convex function. It's convex function omega. These functions should epiconverge as t goes to zero to a generalized quadratic form. Now, if it converge to a quadratic form, we would have really classical second differentiability. This is generalized because it's a generalized quadratic form. Epiconvergence means the epigraphs converge as sets. And this is true for almost every point in the, in the graph of the subgradient mapping. Do you remember it's just any, any lower semi-continuous proper convex function? All right, now I can repeat my trick of, of taking limits. So I'm going to create, instead of a Hessian bundle, a quadratic bundle. So I look at a particular u bar and a particular vector y bar in this. And by the way, why, where am I aiming at? U bar is going to be the constraint this vector f of x bar and y bar will then be a multiplier vector. Okay, anyway, for g at u bar with a, a, a subgradient v bar, I look at all the pairs. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at all, essentially, I'm going to look at all the quadratic, generalized quadratic forms I get by taking limits of the quadratic forms as they exist at nearby pairs that approach my y bar, u bar. I'm calling this, I'm giving this quad notation for the quadratic bundle. All right, now, now I recall again that the, the multiplier condition in this generalized nonlinear programming is the multiplier vector y bar has to be a subgradient of the modeling function g at the, the vector f of x bar. Then the theorem is that the strong variational sufficiency condition holds if and only if for every quadratic generalized quadratic form in this bundle, <coughs> you have a certain positive definiteness condition. And it involves the augmented Lagrangian and as well as this quadratic form here. Now, what's the status of this? There are a number of things such as um, uh, second order cone programming when this coincides with what's already considered the strong variational, strong, uh, 
second order condition. But in other cases, this is slightly stronger than what you have there, and you get you get certain other conditions. So this is slightly, so this is a key idea. By exploring these conditions from the point of view of, of uh, the saddle point uh, property and the variational convexity, we end up with something similar, but a little stronger, something that has been missed because the perspective has been different. So with this perspective, we get slightly, slightly more restrictive conditions, but on the other hand, they yield some very powerful properties. Right now I just have some, some follow-up comments. So uh, then what you can do, of course, is figure out what this all means with various things, because you minimize something with this modeling function, and, and then what, what happens? And what if G is piecewise linear quadratic? What can you do in all these special cases? And then, of course, this is aimed not just at theory, but a, a numerical methodology. That's what strong, uh, uh, what sufficient conditions for optimality are all about, supporting methodology devising methods. So one particular method <clears throat> would be uh, the method of multipliers or augmented Lagrangian methods. And these have the property of that you, you have a sequence of pairs, x, k, y, k, that proceeds by, for your given multiplier, you minimize the augmented Lagrangian to get the next primal vector. And then you make an, the augmented Lagrangian update uh, date to make the new thing. And then this isn't just with classical nonlinear programming. It works even in this case. You just have to know what the multiple, what the update rule is. And there are various ways to write it, but the simple way here is to write it in terms of this, the gradient. So of course you have to know what your functions are. Knowing the function g makes all this specific. And what's known about this me method of multipliers, and which is true here, is that this uh, executes the primal the proximal point algorithm on a dual problem. Well, uh, now, if the variational sufficient condition gives us a local dual problem, a we have a reduction to local duality. So this variational sufficiency then allows us to apply this method of multipliers to a non-convex problem. But of course, we have to be close enough to a solution to make it work. But what's new about that? Newton methods, you need to be close enough to a solution to make them work. So it all fits in that pattern. So then there's a whole another whole theory that has to be worked on how to, how to get close enough, how to know you're close enough, and so forth. But this is a way that all these things can be extended then to non-convex problems. All right, and one of the areas I'm especially interested in for that is this progressive decoupling I've been working about. And that's in a paper already published in Set Valued and Variational Analysis. Uh, a lot of problems of decomposition. That goes beyond generalized uh, nonlinear programming, but uh, but I, I think this is all going to work. But some of the details I'm still writing up uh, how how general to make it. All right, now I just want to want to finish now with I guess I'm running a little over. Sorry, we started a little late though. I uh, want to finish with uh, a, 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 a some philosophy. <clears throat> this uh, strikes me as so interesting that that it's been overlooked all these years, that somehow convexity is, is needed more than we imagined in, in all of this non-convex type of problems. And here I've shown you some, some big class with a lot of applications where this is clarified in the detail, but, but shouldn't this go further? What about something like optimal control? We know the role of convexity in certain ways in optimal control, but Maybe there's some way to look at that in which you could see that there's a local saddle point. Maybe this would lead to some kind of numerical methods that haven't been considered. But anyway, I think there's an awful lot that could be done in this area. And uh, that finishes the talk and I just give these references. So um, at, at the third one is the paper that corresponds to this talk. And it's already been submitted to mathematical programming. And, and you can uh, get all this from my website. That's all. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Terry. Great talk. <clears throat> thank you very much. So it's time for questions. And we have a first question asked by Samir. So I guess there was a misprint in, uh, in the definition. Uh, yeah, on the, it was on the previous slide, I guess. No, on, on the on yeah on, on the side on the slide before, yeah. So it should be TV. No, no, it, it was it was okay. Can I go back, please? This one. So, this one. Yeah, this one. Yes. So it should be division by one half t squared. Oh, yes, 
yes, yes, yes. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Samir. Now, this, this, this was Samir. So, so questions. Okay, please. I, I found a number of typos, and he found one too. This is, thank okay. you. Great. Fix it. If I ever give this talk again, which I would love to do, uh, I will have it fixed. <laughs> Great. So, questions. So, can I ask a question? This is Defeng. Yes, Defeng. Yes. So, Terry, that's a question. Uh, you prove that a strong variational sufficiency is equivalent to the positive definiteness of the Hessian bundle. For that result, do you need a Lagrange multiplier to be unique? No, no, no. So I'm, I'm conjecturing it must be No, unique. this is really interesting. No, this is, a, and I'm really glad you bring this up because this is one of the whole points of this is I don't need a Lagrange multiplier to be unique. And by the way, that's important for these augmented Lagrange, uh, Lagrangian methods, uh, um, methods of multipliers, because there you are interested in solving a pro primal problem, but you're applying a proximal point algorithm to the dual problem. And uh, you want to show linear convergence without necessarily having the solution to the dual problem be unique. But, 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 so, but under this, this condition, what you do have, because you have local convexity a concavity, you have that in this X bar, Y bar, you have a unique X bar, but a convex set of Y bars. And as in convex analysis, any of the, any of the elements of the, of the, uh, well, I could go back to this, uh, where is this uh, primal, there, this primal dual thing, any element, uh, uh, darn. Any solution to the dual problem can be paired. The, the, the pairs of solutions is a product set. Several points is a product set. That's a point. Well, I it's a product set because you just have the X bar, but you don't need the uniqueness there. Okay. Uh, yes, you, yes, I agree with you. Terry. I'm sorry. For a convex problem, perhaps, for the dual problem, if we can write it out, for the dual problem, maybe we have the RCT. We have the linear independence transition coefficient. I'm not following you. You can you could ask for linear independence, but I don't need it. That's right. That's I think that condition maybe I'm thinking for a convex program, right? That condition may be equivalent to the dual linear independent constant qualification. Maybe there's some some equivalent condition, more equivalent condition about the dual problem, at least for a convex problem. I agree with you. Yes, we do not need. It. Yeah, the multiplier to be unique. Uh, no, we could ask. Also, but remember, again, this is <clears throat> when, when I go back. I can go back. I guess to the last slides. Here's I'm, I'm minimizing this function. I don't exactly have constraints, and a lot will depend on the function g. I mean, linear independence of the gradients of the fi's. You know, it, it, it could mean something very special. You could, of course, ask under what conditions you might have a, a unique solution to the dual problem. This is, of course. But I'm yeah, not. Thanks, Terry. I think I got the point. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. I got All it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Defang. Yeah. Thank so, you. other questions? So, Bruno Lorenzo, please ask a question. Oh, uh, we have also Arsene. So, Arsene. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi, Terry. Thank you very much for the nice talk. And I'm particularly impressed by the, the way you fleshed out the second hour sufficient condition without the in linear dependence because they usually go together. And, and that's a very important right. thing, and particularly in control where it is not clear at all what is the sec strong second hour sufficient condition. And maybe this will help a lot in, yes. in identifying this, this condition. But I was just more philosophically, <laughs> as you mentioned, thinking about don't you think that behind the variational convexity, it's hidden the, there is a variational monotonicity hidden? I mean, talking about variation. Oh, there, there is, it's equivalent to local maximal monotonicity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's what you would expect in, in uh, suppose you could extend this to control. This is very speculative because you know, there's so many complications in infinite dimensional spaces and what kind of spaces are you choosing and so forth is infinite dimensional. But um, it, it should be connected with local monotonicity of some mappings. And this would be yes. the key numerical methods. But what is local again? You know, I mean, infinite dimensional, what is local going to be? So a lot of issues, but it seemed to me a lot of intriguing aspects in there. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Asin. Great. So, Bruno Lorenzo, please ask your question. Ah, first, I'd like to thank for the very nice talk. So, I'm I'm not sure if this might be slightly off topic, but I was just wondering uh, what how to make uh, necessary conditions appear in this framework, or if this mach machinery of so or some modification of it can also be used to derive uh, to derive necessary conditions. Well, well, that's a good point. I haven't really thought about it in that in that way. <clears throat> and to some extent, I'm I have um, gotten less interested in necessary conditions. Let's, let's think a little bit about the history of necessary conditions. People kept refining them in this tiniest, tiniest way, but uh, they all, inevitably they involve some kind of constraint qualification, which you can't really uh, verify. So I wonder what good they are. Well, I think one good is it is it helps you understand to some extent whether you're talking about something too special or not. You know, we don't want to make assumptions. You have an algorithm and you and you show it'll converge under some condition, but the conditions are so strong that you can't imagine they would be satisfied. That's obviously uh, something we never want to do mathematically. So, so necessary conditions are good for understanding a problem, but uh, but as I say, I, I don't really believe anymore in the idea of necessary conditions and sufficient conditions being as close as possible to each other. Uh, uh, so I see. So the whole idea of reducing to a saddle point is to some extent already getting into a sufficient condition. Uh, so, so I, I, could, I, was... I, I could have a, a necessary condition where the saddle point is not convex in X, for example. That would be one idea. Well, I, I was actually thinking in a, in a relative naive manner. I know that, for example, usually necessary conditions, they, they come attached with some uh, regularity conditions. But apart from that, it seems, and, and I think it's related to what you mentioned of making uh, necessary and sufficient condition as close as possible. But I, I, I particularly find it's, it's nice that in some cases it's just some inequality that becomes strict or something like that. So just the beauty of right. it. And I was just wondering whether, what, what would right. be the equivalent of this? I mean, not necessarily for usefulness purposes, but. Well, no, no actually I, I'm, getting, I'm warming up to your question, Bruno. So what, what I see is that uh, maybe one, uh, one way of it would be to, to look at uh, say the augmented Lagrangian and look at this uh, saddle point possibility, but 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 say that you instead just have the <clears throat> the, the the condition with um, uh, the gradient equals zero in the in the x argument instead of that you have the convexity. That that could be an example, a necessary condition that the that the, well let's see go back to what I had here in. Uh, Okay, here, here, that, this one. So here you have a condition with the augmented Lagrangian mm. uh, in the middle here, uh, where you have the two gradients equal zero, but you know that in the du dual argument, you have convexity, and so that's very special. But in the primal argument, you just have the gradient equal zero. So I can imagine one thing is to consider necessary conditions of the form that are seen here in, in general. There's a great for the augmented Lagrangian, you have the gradient equals zero. Now, to, to what extent is this version necessary? You know, that could that we looked at. That that could be a, a fruitful avenue. Thank, thank you very much for your answer. All right. <clears throat> oh, thank you. So then uh, it's time to stop. So, so thank you very much. Okay, I was very glad to participate. Thanks everybody for taking part. Thank you very much. So we will post the, the slides and the video on the website. So the thing. Yeah, thanks very much. That's good. Yeah, Great. thank you. I just just want to announce the next speaker in our seminar. Next speaker will be Boris Poyak. Next Monday, same time. So thank you very much, Terry. Great talk. Many participants, great audience, good discussion. So thank you. Stay healthy and see you soon.
but okay. real in Vienna okay. next year, let's say. Yeah? Hope so. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> So, Radu, you have done very well. Fantastic. Very good, Sarah. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>